Hello, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 10, Picking Favorites, part two. Coming to you live from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say how hi to everyone hanging out in the lobby here on Twitch. I saw Commander Root just followed us. Oh, followed. For those listening to the podcast, you can join us live every Wednesday night at 9.30 Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Audience feedback. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, both positive and negative. In regards to our mechanics list, Gillian Schmidt at Board Game Chick on Twitter said, Love it. Great idea for a list. Thanks, Gillian. Gillian and I had a conversation on Twitter about dice rolling and dice mitigation. And there were, uh, sorry, bleh, I can't read my own writing. This is going to be the, the, it's a good thing we're not recording it, so it doesn't become all outtake episode. Thanks, Jillian. Jillian and I had a conversation on Twitter about dice rolling and dice mitigation and whether that fits under worker placement and whether dice placement should have been its own category on um, our list of game mechanics. And then as that conversation went on, she is also the reason social deduction was added to that list. Local gamer Ezio said, this is an extremely useful post. Whenever I have students make board games for school projects, they are always either roll and move or trivia games. This might help them be more creative. Thanks, Ezio. Brian Kurtz had this to say about our sound episode on our Slack channel. This was a great episode, and the coolest thing was hearing about Big G's Tales from Equestria game. I hope it goes well, Mo. I think you were taking the right tack to let her do her thing. I'm intrigued by some of the different audio software used described thanks for the feedback brian i really don't want to raise kids that hate the things i love so far what i've been doing seems to be working now this question came from our chat slack channel you too could have access to if you support us on patreon that's at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop now brad murray writes on g plus this is the first gaming podcast i've enjoyed in a long long time he followed up on Discord, writing, Just listen to eight, and that might be the only podcast I listen to. I've listened to dozens, and really don't like the format, but yours is great. So many are just so dreary and unedited. And I have no patience, but you two have a good pace. You both have radio-quality voices, too, which is unusual. <laughs> well, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks so much, Brad. This means a lot coming from you. Brad is the man behind VSCA Publishing and responsible for such games as Diaspora, Hollow Point, Deluge, and a few more. His latest game he's working on is called Soft Horizon. I actually did some playtesting with Brad on an unreleased game that used to go under the name Zero Dark Thirty uh, that he was working on before the movie came out, and now he has yet to find a new name for it. Well, we get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show... Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Also, we love interacting with our fans on social media. You can find me all over the web as at tabletopbellhop, one word. And you can find Sean as darkelflx. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhop's tabletop? Every week, I like to take a look back at the games we played and the events we attended and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at TabletopBellhop.com. Now, this last week, there was not a lot of gaming. It is still cold season here in Windsor. Back to school season, cold season, they kind of go together. Uh, we had a ton of cancellations. Game nights that were supposed to happen and just people couldn't do it. And I think on one of the nights, at least, we were the ones that canceled. So what I have gotten to do, though, is that has freed up my time to play more on Board Game Arena and play online. And through that, I got Sean to start playing Tokaido. Now, Takaido is a fantastic Zen uh, traveling game that is just so relaxing as you move from point to point down the Takaido, which is this ancient road in Japan that runs to the capital. 
Uh, you score points based on meeting people and having great food and collecting trinkets and catching venues and vistas. It's it's so ven, zen. Sorry, it's so zen. Until you really need just that one last piece of sushi to get you the points and win the game. But to get that, you need some money. And the other damn player sat there and they went to the last farm. So now you can't get any money and now you can't eat. It's Zen. Now, we played the uh, two-player variant. And it, it was interesting. It's... We played, We mentioned this game a few episodes and talked about it sometimes Zen nature. And with two-player, how we started, it really was especially with Board Game Arena taking the cards and counting out of it, let you to just enjoy the traveling down the path, and then all of a sudden the third player, which is played by both other players, stomps on that thing you were going to get to. Oh, yeah. Frustration endures. Yeah, just a little. It's zen. It's totally zen. Yeah, the two-player variant. I like the two-player variant. I don't usually like games that have like a two-player special rules, but it works really well in this game, but it makes it much more cutthroat. You've got that great player, and whoever's ahead moves that player and basically just uses them to screw over the other player. Uh, but I, overall, I love Takedo. The board game arena implementation is solid. There are a couple little things in it i don't like like the fact that when you mouse over the different locations all it tells you is their names what they're for you have to scroll down to read all the rules but other than that it's solid and i really love the game it's one of my favorite two-player games and it was actually back on our list of top two-player games in episode three one of the bigger pro biggest problems i find with the two-player variant and it's only with the two-player variant is the player who's in the in front moves the ghost player, the third extra player, around. Mm -hmm. And there are certain times when there is no option. You have to move that that meeple to a specific place. Yes. And you expect the you expect it like in a computer game that would just automatically happen. Yet in BGA, because of the way they've set up their system, you actually have to remember to do it. And I think a number of times, I'm willing to bet everyone who plays that game there has done their move and then tabbed away to do something else, and sat, let the game has sat sat there waiting for you to move it, that meeple, mm -hmm. uh, when, and the other person can't play because of it, and there's no real alert right away. So, yeah, it needs to take care of that specific function. That is true. I find even when you're your own player, it gets to your turn, and like, yeah, of course I'm going to the end, because the next move's going to the end. You couldn't move me to the end? Yeah. So... Uh, up next would be Gloomhaven. Uh, I've been talking about our ongoing experiences with this rather large epic game. Uh, we did get together with Tori and Kat, and we played this Inox Forest mission. If anyone's played it before, you probably know what happens in this. It was a slaughter. Like, we just walked through this. We're, our four characters... Uh, did some nasty things to an awful lot of Inox. We felt rather evil at the end of this. We were actually sitting there at the end going, well, I guess we're not the good guys in this story. I didn't like that because we had no choice. Like at this point, we're playing through the progression and you're stuck doing set missions. And, and it's one of the drawbacks of Gloomhaven versus an RPG. If we were playing an RPG, I'm sure at some point, if I was running this game, the party would have been like, oh, hell no, we're not doing this. But we were stuck doing it. Now, on a positive note, when we did finish that mission, it finally branched. And then it felt like I was playing a Bioware game. Like I was playing Knights of the Old Republic or... Um, Mass Effect or one of those, because all of a sudden we were given the moral choice. Like, obviously, we were supposed to feel bad for what happened. And it's like, oh, yeah, now you can go this way or this way. And I'm like, all right, that's kind of cool. As for the mechanics of the game, uh, we are playing on easy. I would say so we talked about I talked about extensively on the last episode. Um, I think it may be too easy or it may have been luck. So yet again, we started the map with a bunch of guards in front of us, blocking our path, six of them this time, big guys. And the monster cards, we flipped up again, they didn't move. They sat there and didn't attack and went on defense. Having seen this before, we knew to act before them so they didn't get defensive bonus and we just kicked their butts. Now it was kind of fun being a badass. So I'm not sure, like if we, maybe we should up at a level. Um, 
I don't know. Other than that, we did get our first item blueprint or our first item plan, which that is a neat thing. So during the game, you might find some treasure and it'll say you get a plan for an item. Well, you grab this special item deck, you find every copy of that card, and then it goes into the market deck for the next time we're in town in Gloomhaven. So I thought that was cool. It was a neat way to add new things to the market in the game. It's Another thing. It's a very it's a very modern video game sort of thing. Whereas you look at Fortnite and in the in the more advanced game, not the not the free for all game, you go out and you collect uh, you collect blueprints, and then you can level up the br- mm. blueprints to create better items. You can't actually level up an item; you have to level up the br- blueprints in order to okay. create better items. Yeah, it's it's part of that, but simplified, right? You're yeah. just once you get the blueprint, you get the item. Yeah. But it's cool that the blueprints even exist. Then similarly, we also found a thing where we found a side quest. So what the side quest does is there's a deck, you shuffle and you draw a random side quest, and that gives you a new spot on the map where now next time we play, we can now go there instead of continuing the main plot. Again, very video game like actually. Now, are you able to uh, churn a dungeon? So can you uh, can you go back and uh, to a dungeon over and over again and, and level up, farm it? Yes and no. If you succeed at a mission, it's checked off. No one can ever play it again. If you fail, every time you start a game, the way the game starts is you decide what party to play because this was something I explained on the first time I was talking about Gloomhaven. Something I had no clue existed in this game and actually makes it significantly cooler than I had thought is you don't have to play with the same group all the time. Most legacy games, you're stuck. You're playing with the three people that signed up at the beginning, need to be there for the last game, they need to be there for the first game. In Gloomhaven, technically you start and you just make a party and you go adventuring. Well, once you've done that and gotten past the first couple missions, once there's more than one sticker on the board... You can now make, I could make another party with my Monday night group instead of my Friday night group. And then we could come down, play Groomhaven, put out the map and go, hey, we're going to go explore this spot. And that will change things in the overall world. But if any group finishes a quest, it's done. You can never go back. So I guess you could metagame it. Like if you really wanted to, you could go in and purposely fail over and over to farm it. But I just can't see that being fun. Like at this point, I think we've got six. It's four to six different options on where to go next. So it really opened up compared to when the game first started. So I guess it really, you know, you got to take your time judging this one because there's so much to it. Yeah. It, it, it it funnels you in close uh, in that beginning to give you that, you know, focused experience so that you basically a tutorial almost. And yeah, then even after you're in a couple of games, that's where it branches out and gives you that wide range of possibilities. Yeah, it's another video game thing, really, right? The the in-game walkthrough at the right. start of the game. Yep. So the other thing that's happening is we're finally starting to get the check marks. So at the start of every battle, everyone's given a random goal for that battle. And what's amusing and interesting is sometimes they are not conducive to actually completing the mission. So some of the ones I've seen since I've been playing is like, Make sure every door in the mission is kicked open was one of mine one time. And you may not really want to open all those doors, but if you're the player with that card, you're going to get check marks for doing it. And check marks are basically an XP system. There is an XP system as well, like D&D style XP where you get XP for doing things and you level up. These check marks are similar. Once you get three check marks, you trade those in for a perk. Now, the way the combat is randomized in this is it basically simulates like a D20 roll, but with a deck of cards. There's 20 cards in it, but they're not number one through 20. And they're all like uh, minus one, plus one, plus zero. There's a times two. There's a complete miss. There's a plus two and a minus two. I couldn't tell you the exact distribution. Every time you attack, you draw a card. Well, once you get enough perks or sorry, once you get enough check marks, you get a perk. Those let you approve this deck. So like one of the perks I could have took was take out all of the plus zero cards. Another perk I could get was take out a minus one and replace with a plus one and so on. What's neat is every character class is completely different. Their deck of perks is di- or not their card deck is starts off the same. But once you add perks, what you can swap in and out of the deck is completely different. So that was pretty cool. And she games uh, our moderator, her character actually leveled up. So we got to see one of those. Uh, that let her add a new card to her deck that gives her more options at the start of the match or start of a mission. What's tough, though, is uh, I'm trying to think of an RPG that fits this. You get it'd be like 
in D and D getting new spells, but you'd have to give up your old, old spells to use them. So you get a new card, but you don't just get to add it to your deck and you get that new ability. You got to lose one of your old abilities to put this new card in. So that's something that's a little different. And it's probably going to take a bit to get used to. Well, I guess it's a little bit like uh, memorizing spells. You know, you've only got so yeah. many slots open. You've got to memorize. You can only memorize five spells. Pick which ones you get. Yeah, and that's actually, it's all part of the, the card management system I was talking about last time we talked Gloomhaven, where you only get so many cards and you have to use two a turn. And when you run out of cards, you're knocked out of the fight. And different character classes can hold different amounts of cards. Like, I can hold 11. Cat's character can only hold, like, six or eight. It's kind of crazy. So we finished off the game. I'm one XP from leveling up. I think Tori was pretty close. We ended up back in town. And next week, I think we raid a warehouse. So overall, my impression really hasn't changed. Like, I'm glad to finally see some branching paths. That's really nice. I really dig the random quests. Like, I like we get this quest card and we put it out and it's like, hey, the Howling Hills over here, you heard rumors of treasure. And that's all it says. And now there's a sticker on the map. Um, I like the way items got added to the shop. That was cool. The random travels neat. So every time you leave Gloomhaven to go somewhere, you have to draw a road event. And it's always a which way. It's you see this thing happens. Do you do this or that? And then you flip the card over to find out what happens. Um, and then when you're in town, you can do a city event. Now, those are optional. You can choose to do with them or not. And the city events, again, it's a merchant kind of waves you over and has some thing for sale. But the guy looks kind of skeevy. Do you buy it or not? Stuff like that. It's very neat. Uh, but all of this, like it's trying to emulate games like Diablo and Bioware style games. And it's trying really hard to be a RPG without a DM. But it, it's, it's very it's very reminiscent of a computer game. You the more and more yeah. you talk about this, this is a a tabletop computer game, which I yeah. mean I guess works, but it's it's an interesting concept. So yeah, well, it's the number one game in the world. It works for some people. Well, there's a lot of gamers in the world. I mean, look at the other. Don't look at the other Twitch channels right now. But if yeah, you could yeah, look don't at those look other, now. If you did look at the other Twitch channels, you'd see that there <laughs> are a couple hundred thousand people watching video games right now. So and well, there's. There's the fact that Twitch just added Gloomhaven as a category, so there's probably people playing Gloomhaven right now. The thing I keep asking myself, though, is why shouldn't we just play D&D? Like, if it's going to be that much like an RPG, let's just play an RPG. Now, I realize in an average group, maybe they don't have someone that wants to step up and be a DM. I get that. That happens. Yeah. But I've DM'd for years. Like, Tori, like, we're having fun. We're not going to quit at this point, but it's still, I'm still, you know, it's, it, it doesn't live up to the hype for me yet. It is a DM. I think it really does come down to the DM thing. And I wouldn't be surprised at all to find out that the originator of this game look was looking for, you know, I don't have a computer. I don't have the game. I don't, I don't want to buy a game system. I don't have a DM. What can we do? We don't yeah. have an option. Well, now they have an option. And so, you know, and again, maybe it's not right for everybody, but if you don't have a DM and, and you want to play a, a communal RPG... Mm. This might be the uh, the best choice for some people. Yeah. So I mentioned that this scenario was pretty easy and we walked through it. So we actually finished early. Usually Gloomhaven night, all we expect to do is play Gloomhaven. But we had uh, an hour to kill at the end. And Tori really wanted to show off his Azul skills. So we, of course, showed Tori and Kat Azul and they loved it. And then they go camping every year with uh, Tori's family somewhere up in cottage country here in Canada. And they brought Azul this year. And the whole time they were there, I think Tori had had a bit to drink because I was getting texts at like two in the morning of pictures of his Azul board and how good he was doing or how bad he was doing. And he was laughing about how his mom kept beating them. And he showed up this week and he's like, I finally beat my mom. He's like, I got to see if it's real skills because I'm not sure if I just if I get the game or if it's just I beat my mom. So he wanted to play the three of us. He played the three of us and he won. So I guess he proved his point. Well, you know what, Azul is one of those things where you can develop. There are there are sort of ideas and and, and paths you can take which are going to be more successful than others. I, it'll it'll all come down to randomness to some degree, but you know you you really need to learn to make sure you're paying attention to what other people are grabbing and where they're placing their things, so that if you get a chance to screw someone over, take it. <laughs> You yep. don't want you don't want to be that one who's taking uh, dropping ten ten tiles at the end because. You know, you got left with uh, a lot of drops. Yep, fair enough. 
We normally record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch. We encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Thanks to our moderator, and she Games. And right now, today in the lobby in here, we've got May Suggins is back. Thank you very much. Awesome. Commander Root has followed us for the first time. Uh, we have uh, Banana Nana Nan, or something along those lines. Positivity Banana Bot. Banana Nana Nan. Positivity Bot, Slow Cool, and Tech. Tech 2674. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. We have any questions? Anyone asking anything? Uh, well, there is someone speaking heresy and saying that for which way uh, Legacy Elements, Seafall is the preference. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that's probably our moderator who's that, saying that. That would be, yes. yes. Someone who actually likes Seafall. They do exist. There are people <laughs> out there that like Seafall. The four of you should get together and play a campaign. Oh, other than that, it's looking pretty quiet. We've just had uh, Anchi Games trying to keep people talking, but uh, not a lot of it. Uh, yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening. I know a lot of people like to put us on in the background and do their own thing. Absolutely. We get it, though we do love interaction. We are watching the chat, and we will love, we will love, we would like to interact with you. Something like that. And, We're here. Uh, we'll talk. And- and while we're talking about online, we have dropped 43 frames in the entire time we've been broadcasting this. Uh, yes, we are, we're running over 5,000 kilobits per second at 30 frames per that. second, solid. Uh, we, have seen, we seem to have, knock on wood, gotten over the hump and figured out uh, our problems. Discord is no more, Skype is ruling the land, and... Uh, <laughs> Everything is looking wonderful. We've also switched over to Streamlabs OBS from Open OBS. Yeah, so actually, those of you in the chat, I hope you're seeing it. Let us let us know. Like, are we smoother? We're not sure. Well, not compared to last week, but say <laughs> compared to episode three and four or episode six. Do we look good? Is does it sound good? All that sound shouldn't have changed, but in in theory, this should be our best looking episode ever. I believe. There we go. Um, in, if if the what what I'm sending matches what's actually being received on the other end at Twitch. All right, moving on. In our- honor, in honor of our tenth episode, we are going to launch our first giveaway. That's right. A couple of weeks ago, I was contacted by the Bureau of Dragons over on G+. They wanted to know if I was willing to do a review of this pretty cool thing they have called a license to slay. This is a big piece of uh, fantasy gamer bling that I thought was pretty neat. I also thought it's something you would think is cool as well as we do. So I wanted to be able to share this with our audience. So I asked them, I said, tell you what, send me a review copy. I'll do a review. I'm good with that. But in return, I also want you to give one away to one of our viewers. They wrote back and they're like, yeah, sure. Continental North America only. And I'm like, "Uh, no, I'm from Canada and there's no way I'm going to at least exclude my own Canadian brethren. So after a bit of cajoling back and forth, I got them to agree to ship it worldwide. That's right. Our first giveaway will be open to anyone and everyone across the world, even that one listener in Australia. So here's the deal. License to the license to slay review will go live on Tuesday. Same day as this show goes out in podcast form. Well, technically the show we recorded on Wednesday goes out in podcast form. You people watching live get the special cut here that those listening at home won't get to see or hear. Well, they never get to see it. Anyway, check out the review on the blog and at the bottom of it will be some kind of, excuse me, raffle copter, some kind of contest entry form. I haven't written the review yet. So here's the deal. Uh, oh, that's you. The contents, the contest will run for three weeks, which means it will close on October 30th. That is correct. So tune in next week for more details, and then we'll probably cover the review on the show at that point as well. Also, coming up quick, uh, just under a month away, on November 3rd and 4th, myself and a bunch of local Windsor gamers are going to be gaming for more than 24 hours in support of a charity known as Extra Life. This is a group that donates 100% of what they raise to the Children's Miracle Network of Hospitals. Now, the Windsor Gaming Resource, another venture of the Bellhop, has raised $14,000 over the last five years with no plan on slowing down. 
Yeah, and that is in U.S. dollars, though I do have to admit, Extra Life for the first time ever is accepting Canadian donations this year, which is a huge help for us in the bookkeeping. Absolutely. What we would love is your support, and there's a few ways you can show it. If you go to extra-life.org, O-R-G, search for Windsor Gaming Resource, you'll find our team. If you are participating in Extra Life, no matter where you are, it would be awesome if you joined our team. I will admit I would like to have made a tabletop bellhop team, but the fact that I've gamed with the gaming resource now for six years, I didn't want to give up on that legacy and our total funds raised. I didn't want to branch off and kind of turn my back on them for you guys. But I don't care if you're from Windsor. If you're interacting with me, join our team. Join the Windsor Gaming Resource. If you're not, do it on your own. That's cool, too. Now, if you're not participating in actually doing the gaming, we would love a donation. Now, if you do go to uh, extra-life.org and search for us, Windsor Gaming Resource, you'll see a list of the team members. And next to everyone's name is a button that says Donate. We would love it if you'd hit that button. Just the cost of a coffee, 5 bucks, 10 bucks, 150 bucks, anything. It would be amazing. But even a dollar helps. What I personally suggest is you look at that team and find out who raised the least money so far and give them a boost by donating to them. If you're not comfortable doing that, you'll find me under Maurice Tuzano. All right. There's so many ways you can help, and it all goes to the kids. This is part of an international charity, not a purely local Windsor event or even an Ontario or Canada event. This is international. That's correct. We're also looking for donations of cool geek. Yeah. We're also looking for donations of cool gaming and geeky items for the event. So one of the things we're looking for is games to play during it. We are going to have a bunch of local gamers gaming for many hours and we need stuff to play. Yes, I own a lot of games, but if we play your games, we're going to get the word out that we're playing your games. We're also looking for swag to give away to participants, um, any small items, promos, because what we like to do is for everyone participating is every hour we do a quick giveaway for everyone who's active at that time. Uh, we also have our biggest fundraiser of the year is our Extra Life charity auction. We have a ridiculous number of items for this already, but we could always use more. Now, I realize it's short notice. It's less than a month away. But if you would like to get a hold of me and work something out, we would love to fe feature your products. We would love to accept your support, however you want to make that. You can contact me at mo at tabletopbellhop.com. The last thing you can do is help spread the word. When you see Mo sharing information about the event online on Twitter, Facebook, or G+, like, comment, and share. Now you can find us all across the web now, and we grow by the support of listeners and viewers like you. So please take a minute to subscribe, follow, or however you'd like to appreciate our content on your favorite platform. Give us a like, comment, or review on YouTube, Apple, Google, Twitch, or wherever you find us, and help us spread our gaming advice to the world. I still think that sounds slightly malevolent. Help us spread our gaming advice to the world. We did get our first five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you for that, Brian Kurtz. These really do help. When people go searching on Google or on Apple or on their podcaster for podcast, tabletop, game advice, we want our name to show up. And the best way to get that to happen are reviews on Apple Podcasts. If you stream on Twitch and are interested in a mutual hosting agreement, we would love to hear from you. We host you, you host us, and everyone wins. Just contact Mo at tabletopbellhop.com and we can set something up. Newsletter. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Every Wednesday, we'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released the week previous. Blog posts, podcast episodes, reviews. Uh, I started doing 5-Minute Map Fridays, or Friday 5-Minute Map. Uh, anything else we create, we're going to throw in the newsletter. We're going to send that out to you so you don't miss anything we've sent out. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. You are chatting as me. I know. That's why I apologized as me. <laughs> I need to close that when I know when I've got chatty open. It's just, uh, it's distracting her. Uh, Anything going on in the chat room while we take a second? I see I got some more names in there. Welcome, everyone who has joined us. Yeah, we've got There's Zing, 
Zane Kyber, Subcentral.net, Slowcool have all joined in since we last checked in. Awesome. Thank you all for joining us. Each episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send us your questions to tabletop bellhop, questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop. We also have a G Plus community. It has a section for questions. I'm on Twitter pretty much all day. You can DM or at me there. Uh, if you head over to our Facebook page, Tabletop Bellhop, you can hit us up there. We'll take your questions anywhere and everywhere. We just want you to be able to reach us. Now, today's question, everyone asks, what is your favorite game? Oh, seriously. Like, since starting this, some variation of this question I get asked, like, almost every day. It's usually the first thing asked by new people who join us in chat. The first thing I get a DM on on Twitter, uh, well, except for people saying, please share my Cards Against Humanity knockoff Kickstarter. Please share it for free for, you know, props. God. To be fair, while we joke, there are some good reasons for this question between gamers when looking at someone they may or may not want to hear advice from. Yeah, it's it's true. I get it. I I get why people want to know what games I like. Uh, it's kind of gets annoying being asked so often, but I understand because you want to know, do we have anything in common? How can you trust the info I'm putting out, the content we provide, if you don't have a base to build on, to know who we are, what we're into, and basically what our credentials are, are we actually worth listening to? Yes, absolutely we are. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I thought it was my turn to answer a question for a change. <laughs> oh, there you go. No, it's true. Like, I, there is a podcast out there I subscribe to, and I put it on, and I listen to it, and they spent an hour and 20 minutes talking about werewolf and mafia and how to play it better and what cons are best to play it at. And like, I'm like, wow, okay, fair enough. Not my kind of game, but good enough. Then I listen to the next episode and they're like, okay, this is how you play werewolf with this variant. And this is how you play this. And have you played, um, coup? And then the next episode, I noticed the episode title was about the resistance. Okay. I've mentioned it before on the show, especially when I talked about our review of the thing. I am not a social deduction fan. I just put up a blog post today that you may want to look at that talks about a rather popular game werewolf and my thoughts on it. I do not get the game. It is not something I enjoy. So after listening to three episodes of this podcast, I unsubscribed. I get it if you do the same, but please don't. I like lots of games. We're about to get to that. I probably like something you like, but I want to know what a broadcaster or a reviewer or a board game media person likes so I know if we have anything in common and I know if when they say, hey, this game's great, I should go, ooh, they like it. Maybe I'll think it's great too. Or to be purely honest, the opposite is also true. There are a couple reviewers out there. I want to hear what games they like so I can avoid them. So this gives you that basis of comparison. So this is how I made the list we're going to go through. So we're going to go through my top 20 games of right now. Well, of about a week ago. Because the whole thing is my taste change, like I, almost daily. I'm all about what I want to play now. Actually, to be honest, I'm really hot on a game called St. Petersburg right now. And if I had created this list today... Not a week ago, St. Petersburg probably would have been in there somewhere. And then there's other games that are only, like, they're not the best games, and I know it, but I'm like, oh, man, I really want to play this. Or the opposite. Some game, like, to be honest, Azul, I'm getting a little sick of it. I'm finally hitting that point. To be, You'll hear about it later, because it stayed on the list. But at this point, Azul has come up, and people are like, you want to play Azul? And I'm like, nah, you know what? You guys play. I'm going to go do something else. I'm starting to get a little burnt out on it. So it does happen. But that's why I'm calling this my top 20 of right now. And literally, it's my top 20 of last week when I made this list now because it's been a while. This is a similar problem to any parent uh, who has kids. I know my kids are regularly saying, what is your favorite uh, show, music, whatever? And they... As young as they are, they have absolute favorites. They may only mm -hmm. know 20 TV shows. So if you ask for them for their top 20, they know it. And it's it's there. It's concrete. 
Whereas if you've been around for 40 years and have watched <laughs> thousands of TV shows, it's a little harder to pick a favorite uh, mash. But um, other than that, <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's a little tougher. So when you've got a thousand board games stacked up on every bookshelf and, and uh, surface around you, it's a little tougher to pick 20 of those as your favorite. <laughs> Fully understandable. So the other thing is... This list is not in any specific order. Like it's in an order, but the order doesn't matter. I used a website called the Board Game Ranking Engine. I'll put a link in the show notes, but it's it's pretty close to that. I remember when we did this last time, we were able to drop it in chat. If we can drop the link in chat, we will. Just don't go do it now. Watch us first. You can play with it after. This thing's pretty cool. So the main feature it has that everyone's going to love who's a hardcore board gamer is you can import your own game list from board game geek now if i do that as sean mentioned there's thousands well not thousands not quite that bad but more than a thousand games are going to end up in this list uh the other thing is that it imports everything so you get all the expansions so like not only would i have to rate x-wing i'd have to rate the b-wing fighter versus azul which gets a little weird um so what i did was i exported my board game geek uh ranking my my owned collection to Excel, and then I filtered it to take out all the expansions. Then I filtered it again for anything I rated seven or higher on Board Game Geek. Then I imported it to Board Game Ranking Engine. Then all it does is it gives you two words, one game, two game, you pick left or right. So it'll put up and it'll say Terraforming Mars, Azul. And at the time, all I did was go, what would I rather play right now? And at that point, I was probably Azul, but it might have been Terraforming Mars. I don't remember which. And that's great and it took hours like really hours like more than six or seven but i didn't just do it because it was a little too boring so i would like click on a couple i'd go do something else i click on a couple i'd share stuff on tabletop underscore deals on twitter then i do a couple other things click on a couple more links and so on but man it's hard because you're often comparing apples to oranges or apples to bells because it's just like I have to now decide Hamster Roll, one of the best dexterity games I own. Very cool game. And Terra Mystica, which is this super heavy fantasy game where you got 14 different races trying to terraform the world. How do I compare the two? Like one's a giant wooden wheel you put blocks on and it's a lot of fun. And the other is all about terraforming a planet, which is also a lot of fun. Or comparing Pitch Car to Puerto Rico. Or what's the best role selection game you have versus the best dexterity game you have? They're both the best, but do I really feel like playing a role selection or a dexterity game? Unfortunately, without without narrow categories to, to work yourself into, you run into a real problem. Which is better, the Large Hadron Collider or a Pina Colada? You know, uh, I don't how have, do you... <laughs> based on do, everything that's happened since they started the Hadron Collider, well, <laughs> I, I'm going to have to go with the Pina Colada there. Tales from the Loop in reality. Yes. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, and we've... We'll, we'll probably talk about this again later, but really, um, if people want to ask us, you know, what is your favorite uh, deck building uh, game or what is your favorite dexterity game, that becomes much easier. We can narrow yes. that down to three or four games. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're asking what is your favorite game, yeah, that's it's it's a tough one. And that's why there is not going to be any. This is the number one game, even Correct. if board game, even if board game geek wants to call something number one, <laughs> uh, we won't. Yeah, you'll know their number one is not on my list, which if you've been listening since the start of the show, should be pretty obvious. Uh, also, that's one of the reasons I went to 20 games, because I was just going to do 10, and it ends up I really like heavier Euro games, and there was a very skewed that way. And I noticed like a lot of the dexterity games didn't quite get there, but they were in the top 20, so I expanded it to get more of my gaming tastes. So on to the list. Um, number one, I shouldn't even say number one. The first item on the list the, the arbitrarily first decided... Actually, it's in the order that Board Game Ranking Engine gave me. So this is the order they came up with. Is Terraforming Mars. One of the main criteria for Board Game Geek ratings. It's a scale of 1 to 10. And most people go on there and they just rate it 1 to 10. They go, yeah, it's a 6, it's a 10, it's a, it's a 3. If you mouse over the number, though, it has like a description. And one of them is, love this game never tired of this game and will never turn down an offer to play this game. And that is how I feel about Terraforming Mars right now. 
I can't see saying no. Like if someone called me out, say, hey, want to play Terraforming Mars tomorrow? Like, great. I went to Brimstone Games tonight for a game night. We'll cover what I did play on next week's Week in Review because we're recording out of order and it's kind of messing that up in my head. Like, we've already played another Gloomhaven scenario, too. So talking about Gloomhaven earlier was a little weird. Some, like, time travel going on. So I brought games and we played games. But in the bottom of my milk crate was a copy of Terraforming Mars just in case someone wanted to play. Um, to kind of add to that, Angie Games was with me tonight. And she said, I admit it. I finally have a favorite game. She's like, I have one. Out of all your games, I, I have one Terraforming Mars. Like, it's just that good. It's a engine building game and what i love on it is it has dials you can sit there and play the basic rules with starting resources with beginner corporations and hammer out a game in an hour with experienced players max two hours with people who've never played before or you can jump in put in all the corporate wars stuff draft corporations and then draft your projects every turn so that everyone gets to see almost every card and you're going to eat through the decks twice and it's going to take you probably three maybe even four hours depending on ap and you're still playing the same game from the same box to be able to have that broad and experience is fantastic and what that's even better for is when i show up to a game night i can play with those knobs to suit it to the group who's present that night and I enjoy playing on the easy as well as on the hardest levels. Not that it really ever gets that hard and not that it's really all that easy either. You know, I, I really enjoy this game. I've, I've only had the, ch- uh, the chance to play it once so far. Uh, but I really look forward to sitting down again, playing some of the more difficult uh, variants and, uh, you know, playing with those dials turned up a little bit more to see that I to make sure I, I still do enjoy it. But based on that first initial play where I had the... Uh, the easy mode set, it was mm-hmm. a great game. Yeah, the beginner corporation. Yeah. Uh, up next, as I said earlier, that's on the list, and I don't even know if it belongs there now, is Azul. So Azul's fantastic. I got it. There's a reason I'm sick of it. I played it a lot. Like, I'm looking at over 50 times. There aren't games I own I play 50 times. Azul is one of them. Azul was the game we played when we first showed up to play board games, and we're waiting for everyone to show up. And then Azul was the game we played at the end of the night, and we're like, oh, we still have an hour. Sometimes in there, Azul was just the game we played three or four or five times in a row. When we went to King Queen City Conquest, I only packed four games. Azul was the top of that. Terraforming Mars was the other. I did also bring laser riders and climbers because I thought they'd be neat to show off. Uh, But Azul was in that pile. We only actually played board games together, the three of us, at Queen City Conquest uh, two of the nights, and we played Azul. We also played the climbers once, and I kind of showed off laser riders, but we brought it. We played it. Azul, when my wife and I had an anniversary staycation, we brought Azul. We stayed in the coolest hotel room ever it was called the brewmaster suite where we had a door that opened to a private balcony in a brewery and that balcony had a little one foot wooden table we must have played eight games of azul on that one foot table while drinking craft beer like i do dig the game it just uh, it's it's beautiful it's simple to teach i hate saying it's simple to teach difficult to master that's such a catchphrase that everyone uses but it's true in this case the game is easy to teach and i know i haven't mastered it seeing as tori beat all three of us on friday so there's still more to learn and then plus if you think you're good at as well just flip that board over because that blank space looks all inviting like oh i could do what i want it's wishy-washy oh heck no like you've got to follow some patterns or you're not getting anywhere in that game so, yes, you, you can tell I still like this game, right? Like, now I'm talking about, okay, maybe I'll play a game of Azul tonight if D wants to when we're done. But I, I have played it an awful lot, and it is starting to wear on me just a bit. Ah, well, next up, we've got our only twofer of the night. So, technically, this is a top <laughs> 21, but this is a rebrand. Yes, so... Wallenstein Shogun, there is a reason they're grouped together. They are basically the same game. Uh, Short history of Wallenstein. There is a local gamer here named Neil who is really into heavy stuff. Neil is into heavy stuff and has been for years. It was, there was no splatter. There was no food chain magnet in Indonesia 10 years ago. 
he had heard about this German area control game called Wallenstein and wanted it so bad that he imported a copy. Then he went and found print and play versions of all the cards, sleeved them so we could have the English in front of the German just so we could play this game. And his game group fell in love and invited me out to play on a couple occasions. And I fell in love. This is a great game that combines a ton of different mechanics Speaking of which, we're probably going to mention lots of mechanics in this episode. Tune into our last episode for definitions of most, if not all of them. And if I mentioned one tonight I missed last week, let me know and I'll add it to the list. That's the so episode we, nine for mechanics. Episode nine. Of yes, the that is correct. This is episode 10.5, I guess. I don't know what this is. This isn't the podcast anymore. It's just the live show. You guys get the bonus content. So it's a folk on a map cube pusher. I didn't think I put cube pusher in. I should have. Um, you are controlling areas. So you've got a map of Germany and you've got cubes all over it showing things you own. Think the beginning of risk, but then don't think about risk anymore because it, it's nothing like risk after that point. So you were sitting there. And so every place you get dudes, you get a card that shows I own this province. You can show the other player. You're like, look, I own all these provinces and they can show yours. It's cool. And then you have a board in front of you with a bunch of different actions. And the actions are things like tax your people. They don't like that. Um, Take food from your people. They don't like that either. Um, build temples. They like that. Build theaters. They like that. Build castles. They like that too. Okay. No, I'm Wallace Dean Shogun. I think those are the buildings from Shogun. These games are that similar that I forget the names of the buildings. But there's three levels of buildings. A small, medium, and a large one. Those are the three. In Shogun, there are low temples, theaters, and castles. Actually, theaters are the smallest, then temples and castles. Building those up in your provinces and am I forgetting moving troops or moving dudes, folk, sorry, moving folk around on the map or attacking. Now you look at this board and you think risk, right? Like I mentioned risk for a reason. You look like you're going to use your cubes and try to spread your cubes all over the whole board and take everyone else out and win. No, not at all. That is not the point in Wallenstein. The point is to own key areas and build them up by building those buildings and then keep them um, around for your scoring phase. Each round, the most attacks you can possibly do are two. And you can only do them from two provinces. So every round, maybe you're attacking twice, but often it's not even worth doing. You're probably going to spend a few rounds moving your guys around to build them up, and then you're going to attack with them. And the game isn't long. I think you only play six or eight rounds, so the amount of attacking is very low. So when you look at the game, you think, dude's on a map, big war game. No, not really. Like, there is war. There is conflict. You are going to fight battles, but there is almost more of a focus on controlling your economy, making sure your provinces are fed, making sure you have enough building or money to build those three different types of buildings and score the most victory points. And then when combat does happen, it's not about capturing everything your opponent has. You want to capture those key places that have the good buildings. So if your opponent builds a castle, now you, you put a target on the board. You may want to capture that castle because during scoring, castles are worth three points. So that's the other thing. This is a point-based game. It's almost a point salad. You are not getting points for attacking. You're getting points for the areas you control and the building's built in them and then there's points for whoever controls the most of an area because the board's color coded so it's a very much a euro game cube pusher with uh dudes on a mac veneer on it then there's the neatest part because it is dudes on a map and there is going to be conflict conflict is handled in the coolest way in this game this is the first cube tower game from this designer and it's a cardboard tower with like a flare at the top and uh, the base is down here and you drop your cubes in it and whatever comes out of the bottom is what survived the fight. And then you count up, is there more of my cubes or the opponents and whoever has more cubes wins. Now the brilliant part is this tower is like a dice tower, but not everything falls out. There's like a lattice of cardboard in there and the cubes get stuck. So you never know exactly what's going to happen. And then added to that, at the start of the game, you see the tower with 10 cubes of every player in there. So there's always a chance troops are going to jump out later. So you may attack with only three guys and he's got 10 defenders. And all of a sudden you get lucky and all your cubes fall out that round and you win a fight you didn't expect to. 
Now, all of that gets wrapped around with a programmed movement system. So you have the eight actions, you have your provinces, you have to put those provinces on the actions, and that's where the provinces happen. Uh, when I mentioned when you tax your people, they get pissed off. Well, when that happens, you might have to fight against the farmers. The farmers are green cubes, and there's nothing worse than trying to figure out if you're going to starve in a year and having to fight your own troops against your own farmers and possibly getting wiped out by the local populace because you taxed them too much. There's a lot going on in this game, and it's fantastic. Now, Wallenstein... Medieval Germany, here's a map of Germany. Shogun takes the exact same game, all the mechanics are the same, the number of provinces are the same, the points you get for building things are the same, the eight actions are the same, everything is the same except it's set in Japan, you have Samurai, and the map is different. Interestingly, Shogun has a two-sided map, and one's a little more PvP than the other side. The other one's easier to turtle. Of the two now, I prefer Shogun because I think the theme is cooler most of the time. And that's what I'll always teach a new player. But for experienced players, Wallenstein's more cutthroat because the provinces touch each other more. It's more interconnected. So depending on the group you're with, you may want to go with one or the other. All right, so we've got a... Uh a difficult, uh, difficult game in concept, but I think once once you get yeah. playing, it starts uh, it starts making a lot more sense. Uh, the dice tower mechanic is is such an interesting one. Now, am I correct in thinking that there are some of these dice towers where you can actually adjust the difficulty, or is that a different type there, of dice tower? Uh, what it is with the dice towers in these, you can flip the cardboard on the inside. And I don't know, there's threads and threads on Board Game Geek about it that when Shogun first shipped from Queen Games, too many cubes were falling out, according to the Wallenstein fans. And then someone determined that the factory assembled them all wrong and that if you just flip this one piece from the A side to the B side, more pieces get stuck. I, I don't know if any of this is legit, but people on Board Game Geek have determined that there's like an optimal way to set your tower. I play with what came in the box. I play it enough, but I never really noticed that more cubes follow to Shogun than Wallenstein or the other way around. Just just doing a quick image search, I ran into a couple of towers where you actually had like an, an insertable uh, card that basically set the difficulty depending on how, how big it was and how many uh, cubes it would let through. So, oh, I don't know. That's I don't I think, I those, think maybe are, those are custom. Yeah, people have got their own uh, buy your own Wallenstein base yes. tower from Company X. So, so something I up. didn't. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Something I didn't mention on the last episode. There is another modern game that uses the cube tower that's worth checking out. It's Stefan Fell's Amerigo. What's really neat in that one is he doesn't use the tower for combat. Instead, it's for action selection. So there's eight different possible actions you can do in the game. And I'm not going to remember them right now because I haven't played the game in a long time. But there's like build things and move your ships and whatever. Well, you drop in cubes and whatever cubes come out, those are the actions you can take. I thought that was a different way to do it. So, like, if all the green cubes come out, you can build. The blue cubes come out, you can recruit military or whatever. It was a very unique use of it because it had nothing to do with combat whatsoever. And it's an interesting mechanic, and the fact that you can use it for multiple uh, types of yeah. um, of mechanics um, is great. Uh, so next yeah, up, I... next up, we've got our uh, Richard Brees game on the list. Yes, Keyflower. This is uh, the designer. Every game he makes, he puts the word key in it. He has Keythedral and Keeper and I don't know. There's lots. Keythedral. Uh, key keeper, Harvest. Key Dawn. Key, harv key Flow. Yes. Lots of key games. Of those, the best I've played is Key Flower. Now, I had a hard time describing this last time in take one. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do better, but I'm going to try to cut it shorter at least. So Key Flower has a very unique auction mechanic that uses Meeple hidden behind a screen where you're going to bid on tiles that are out. What's neat is the Meeple are in three different colors. So you don't own the red and Sean doesn't own the yellow. I have red, yellow, and blue Meeples behind my screen. I use those to bid on tiles. Once someone has placed a bid, everyone else has to bid with the same color. We don't know what colors everyone has. So it's a really neat blind bid auction and there's some push your luck. You're like, oh, I'm going to put a blue because I don't think anyone's got any blue left. And oh, 
shoot, Sean had two blue left. He won the tile. Similarly, you can activate the tiles instead of buying them. When you activate them, you use a similar system. You put one meeple, you get to do it. The next person that plays has to put two meeple, but they have to be the same color. So that's a neat thing with the color coding. The other thing is when you get these tiles, whoever wins the auction puts them in their kingdom and your kingdom builds. I shouldn't say kingdom because it's farms, but like kingdom builders, kind of a theme thing. You're starting off with one hexagon. You're going to add more hexagons to your player area. Uh, when you're going to use things though, you can use your own or you can use anyone else who's playing by sending your meeple to their island or kingdom or whatever you want to call it to use their stuff. The thing is when you do that at the end of the round, they get to keep those meeple and then use them for the next round's auction and bidding, which is very neat. Added to that, it's a very cool tile laying, build your own little thing with it. You're trying to collect resources. You're going to use those resources to upgrade all those tiles. When you upgrade them, you flip them over and they do more things. There's a pickup and deliver element where you're going to take the resources and try to move them onto certain tiles by the end of the game. So the way that works is you may have a forest and every round it's going to generate wood. Well, if you could t get the wood, it just sits on the forest unless you use a cart and horse to move it around. Well, the wood on its own is not worth anything to you, but you may get the lumberyard card tile later in the game, the lumberyard tile says at the end of the game, for every block of wood on here, you get one point. So once you have those two, you're trying to transport between the two and there's a whole pickup and deliver thing. It's very neat, very cool game. Not the easiest to teach, but it's one of those games that by round two or so, everyone gets it. Unless they don't grok the auction, which happens, and every time that happens, it's one of those, I don't know how to teach you better here, try to read the rules, because it is a very unique auction system. Key Flower, very neat game. If you're ever in Windsor, let me teach it to you because it's good. I've taught it enough times now. I'm confident teaching it. It's not uh, a pickup easy to play, and not a lot of games do the same thing as it. So it's some unique concepts. Very cool game, though. So uh, just looking here, and Key Flower is the seventh game in the yeah, Key wow. series by uh, R&D Games set in the medieval Key Land is the official, yes. the official description. And it's not to be confused with the new Richard Garfield card game that's supposed to beat Magic, because that also has key in the name. It has nothing to do with this. I can't remember what that's called. But no, it's it's, it's R and D Games is who has the key series. Yeah, there's one I really want to try. Key Per supposedly has a board you fold, and depending on what's showing once it's folded, is what resources you get. Like, dude's brilliant for coming up with new ways of doing things. I do want to check that one out. And so next up is the game that I still have yet to figure out. <laughs> yes, Race for the Galaxy. I will get to the negative last probably. This is a pure action selection, hidden action selection game that is a 4X game. We talked about 4X on previous episodes. It's a sci-fi game where you are going to explore, which is, it's all, excuse me, card driven. You're going to explore to get new cards. You're going to develop technologies. You're going to settle worlds. Once you've settled some worlds, you're going to start producing goods on them, and then you're going to consume those goods to generate victory points or cards. This is one of the first games that had multi-use cards. So a card on your hand can be used as the card it is to play it. You can also use the cards in your hand to pay for the cards you're playing. So if this card has a two on it, to play it, I have to discard two other cards. Also, your cards are rep er, re resources are represented by cards. So if the planet on the table produces rare minerals, you put a card on it to show if it has rare minerals or not. It is one of the best two player games I own, even though it uses a two player variant, which all it is, is you choose two actions instead of one. It is just as good with three, four, five, six. And I think I've even played it with seven people. The base game only plays four. every expansion that comes out, adds another player. If you want. Now there is a slight caveat to that, that the, base game is good not great you really need at least the first or second expansion or first expansion and possibly the second gathering storm is a must-have uh rise to power i think is the second one there's three expansions that came out in the first trilogy the third one so so which is alien or empire versus imperium you can probably leave that one behind it's okay but the first two you want first one must have second one optional 
that makes the game more interactive. There's more cards that care about what other people are doing. Now, there are a lot of detractors out there that call this game multiplayer solitaire. I totally disagree because if you know how to play Race for the Galaxy, you know the cards that are in the deck, a few things are going to happen. One, you're going to be used, able to use the Explorer Plus 5 action to try to steal cards and you can hate draft. If you know your opponent's collecting Uplift Race and you get Uplift Race cards in your hand, you hold on to them so they can't get them. So that's one way. The other, though, is trying to... The, the key to winning in Race for the Galaxy is to get your opponents to do your work for you. So the whole thing with the hit movement is i don't know what phase you don't know what phase i'm going to pick and i don't know what phase you're going to pick but i'm going to try to guess what phase you're going to pick so that i don't have to take that one so you do the work of choosing the phase and i just get the bonus for carrying along with what you did if that's not player interaction i don't know what is because that is a huge amount of the game once you really get into the game now, the problem is really getting into the game because Race for the Galaxy has got to have two to three hundred different stupid icons on all the cards, and it is not easy to learn. It doesn't help that they didn't they named things the same and didn't break them up. So there's the Explorer action. That's action one. But there's two cards that say Explorer. One says Explorer plus one plus one. The other one says Explorer plus five plus zero. Why not call them two different things? Why not call one Explorer and the other send out satellites or something? Like just so when teaching the game, I don't have to tell people that, no, no, these are both Explorer, but one does one thing and another one does another. Even worse is the consume power because there's consume times two and consume trade. And on the cards, some cards have powers that are trade and some have consume, but they both go off in the consume, but only the trade one, like it's dumb. It just, it could be so much simpler better explain something and the icons are like there you know what once you learn the icons are great i can pick up any card from race of the galaxy they could put a new expansion tomorrow and i'll be able to grab the card and know what it means once you learn them but there is that learning curve and it is not it is a steep one yeah it's one i've struggled with uh as we talked about last time there were some uh pizza pizza rolls and uh <laughs> and things yes. in the way of, of learning the very last time i sat down but uh, next up, we have uh, J.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit, a deck-building adventure. Oh, wait, nope, sorry, it's called Clank. Yes, there, there is a Hobbit deck-building game, I'm pretty sure. So yes, Clank, a deck-building adventure. A uh, bit of history. The reason I love this game is there is a burst of nostalgia that comes with it, and it's a fantastic game. So back in the day, I actually was just writing about this today on, on the blog. Uh, back in the day, I got my games from a place in the mall called uh, blah, 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 Leisure World. The first game I bought, spending my own allowance, was a game called Talisman. Man, was that ever a good pick for something I probably grabbed because the box cover looked cool. Because, man, it's a great game. Like it has its issues. It doesn't belong on this list. But especially back then, it was fantastic. Back then, it would have been my top 20. It would have been Talisman. Talisman with the dungeon. Talisman with the dragons. Talisman with Timescape. You, know, you get the idea. I played a lot of Talisman back then. But I learned. I'm like, oh, Talisman's good. So I go back to the store, and here's this bookshelf. And there's games there that have their names. And it says, by the makers of Talisman. So I bought all those. One of my favorites that wasn't Talisman was a game called Dungeon Quest. So this was a... Games Workshop game set in the Warhammer universe where you have a big grid and in the middle is a dungeons layer and there's four towers. Each player picks a character and puts them in the towers and then you explore this dungeon by drawing tiles and random stuff happens along the way. But the goal is to get in, get as much treasure as you can and get out before one of two things happen. One is it becomes daylight because you're sneaking in at night and there's a time track. If that ends and you're not and you're still in the dungeon, you're doomed. The other thing is the dragon can eat you. So you don't want to be eaten by the dragon. So you want to get in, get treasure, get out and not get eaten. Well, Clank is almost identical to this. You are playing thieves. You are raiding a dragon's lair. You have to sneak in. You have to grab an artifact and you have to get out before the dragon eats you. And I've yet to see anyone else compare Clank to Dungeon Quest. But man, to me, like, they scratch the same itch. I play Clank and I get that same tension, the same joy of sneaking in and getting the treasure and knowing, oh man, I've, I'm pretty sure I have five more bucks than that guy if I can just make it out. Or pushing my luck going, you know what? Screw it. You think you've got enough? You've escaped? I'm going two more squares in. I'm raiding this dragon's treasure and then I'm going to try to get out. I get that same joy in Clank. 
The thing is, Dungeon Quest was an old game, and like many of those old games, it had problems. There was player elimination. It was far too random. You could die too easy. There was an overpowered character that if anyone plays it, they always won. It had issues. Old, old school game. Clank is a modern game, a solid modern deck builder where everyone has starts with the same deck of cards. Everyone buys from a central market like Star Realms or not like Dominion because new cards come out every time. Star Realms is a good example or Ascension. Um, you're improving your deck and getting better. It adds in stuff like the treasure is heavy, so it makes your deck garbage as you get more treasure in it because you're carrying more stuff. And the whole theme of the game, Clank, has to do with sound. So some of the cards cause clank and ones like trip and stumble are two that everyone gets in their deck. So no matter what, you're making some noise. You make, as you make noise, you put your cubes into a bag. When the dragon notices you guys, you draw cubes out of the bag. And if they draw your color, you take damage. You're sneaking in, you're pushing your luck. You're trying to get out. You're trying to improve your deck. You're trying to get more treasure than the other guy. Uh, I, I love it. It is a fantastic modern version of Dungeon Quest. I no longer feel the need to own Dungeon Quest except for the fact it's old and it's cool, so I keep it on my shelf. Yeah, no, I somehow I have managed to miss Clank so far, and we're yeah. going to have to rectify that at some point. Um, yeah, it's good. I, I, I can't help. But think of, of The Hobbit, though. Anytime you're going in to steal treasure from a dungeon. Well, that's it's, you know, it's, part of it's, it. It's kind of the, uh, the, the originator of, the, uh, of the, that concept. Uh, mm -hmm. But next, we go from the old school Tolkien to the new and futuristic robotic, <laughs> uh, robotic AI programming system. Yes, we move on to Robo Rally. The penultimate program movement game now there are a lot of editions of robo rally there's more editions of robo rally than some rpgs not the world's most popular rpg but some rpgs there are multiple editions and they are all slightly different and that hurts me because anytime i tell people to play the game they they don't know what to buy. And the latest version is definitely, in my opinion, not the best. My personal favorite is the original Wizards of the Coast version written by Richard Garfield, the guy behind Magic the Gathering, with the silliest theme that there's this huge, dangerous factory run by robots. And the humans are dead or gone. You don't know which. And they get bored. So they decide to start racing around this deadly factory. And that's what you do in this game is you have a bunch of tiles that represent this crazy factory with conveyor belts and flamethrowers and lasers and crushers and pits and spinners and crazy stuff. And you sit there and you put some flags out on the map and you go, go first one to hit. Flag three, and you got to stop it. All the other ones along the way wins. And the way you do that is you get a hand of cards and you program it like logo. You've got move forward two, turn left, uh, move forward three, turn 180. And you have so many slots to program them. And the neat, amusing part is you do this blind. So you don't know what anyone else is programming. You put all your cards face down and then you flip them up one at a time. Two things invariably happen. One, you wanted to turn left, and instead you turned right, and now you ran into a pit or did something stupid. The other thing is the other player's robots are moving, and if you move in front of another robot and he moves, he pushes you. As soon as you get pushed, everything you've programmed is probably messed up. Unless you're really good at Robo Rally and you anticipate that he's going to push you and so on. It's a brilliant game. Now, as for addition changes, the original Robo Rally had a centralized deck. It was a Wargamers game. You had little chits and little counters and lots of decks of cards and everything. It had rules for what was called virtual robots, which is the most confusing rules I've ever been in a board game, where if you die and someone else dies and you both respawn at the same time, you are virtual until you move. But then if you're still on top of someone, you stay virtual. And like it's the most it's like grappling rules in some RPGs. It's terrible. I still kind of like it. So the second printing that came out, and this was by Avalon Hill, put out plastic miniature or plastic flags instead of chits. Uh, they took out 90% of the cards. They got rid of a lot of boards, but they completely removed the virtual robot rules by having like a starter board so that when you respawn, you start on spots one through eight and it's a new board you attach to the map. I'm like, all right, cool enough. The latest version which is, again, by Wizards of the Coast, but put out through their Hasbro brand, or Hasbro's Wizards of the Coast brand, made it like a cheap mass market toy. They are cheap plastic mechs. The player boards are probably about as thick as the sheet of paper. Really unimpressed. There are chick counters that like are literally thinner than this. Um, they took away all the decks and gave every 
player their own individual deck. There's no more damage counters. But they did some neat modern stuff with the rules. So one of the problems with the old game was your initiative was set by what cards you picked. And in general, going straight was quicker than turning and going straight three was quicker than going straight one, but not always. Every now and then someone would draw draw a move one that was faster than move three. So you could kind of anticipate what people were doing. In the new game, initiative is based on this transmitter. And supposedly all your robots are remote controlled because the robot that's closest to the transmitter goes first and the robot that's furthest away goes last. This is kind of cool because there's it took out a whole bunch of math. Oh, who's got that? You have 350, I have 352, so I go for, like you don't have that anymore. You just oh, you're closer to transmitter, you go. So that's cool. I, I like that addition. The other thing that is they took the central deck of cards, threw that out, and gave everyone their unique, uh, sorry, their own deck of cards. So it's like a deck builder that way. The thing is, they're all the same. So it's not like each robot, not like Twonky has a different deck than Spinbot. Yes, those are actual names of robots in the game. So you would now have a set deck. So this is. I don't know, good or bad. In the original game, you would get screwed. You would draw from this high, huge deck and draw all go forwards. You would draw all curves one turn. That's a lot less likely with these individual decks because there's a lot less of each individual type of card, so there's more chance of randomness. So that's kind of neat. But then they removed damage, where before you got damage, you just took counters. And once you'd taken five, one of your registers was locked, which was amusing, because what it meant, whatever was programmed there last turn is just going to happen every turn. So if on phase four you had turn left, you're going to turn left on phase four every time. They took that out. So now they use deck building. So when you take damage, you put these damage cards into your deck, and you shuffle before programming. And if you draw these cards, you get cards that do things like this registry does nothing or repeats the last thing. I don't know. I, I'm on the fence on if that's an improvement or not. So I like the individual decks, I think. I really like the, the order, the turn movement. That's kind of better. And then they changed the upgrade cards. So in the old game, you had to stop on a pit stop, basically. Your robot would repair, and you could buy upgrade cards. Well, now they use the mechanics from King of Tokyo, a really popular Yahtzee Kaiju game where you get little cubes and you get some every turn. And once you have enough cubes, you can turn them in for new tech. It's very simple compared to the old game and much less strategic or tactical because you don't have to try to stop on those pit stops. You can go wherever you want and eventually you're going to get upgrades. Again, it seems more mass market kidified. Like my daughter, who's probably not going to be able to control, excuse me, control a robot well enough to end on a pit stop after three turns is going to get an upgrade anyway, which is fun for her. So I'm, so, so on the new edition, I kind of think you should almost buy the, if you could possibly buy the old edition and maybe use the new decks. I haven't found a perfect way to play. Personally, I just grab my old version sitting over there and I play the old original Wizards of the Coast version. You know, I've played, I played the new version. Uh, we played it at a, uh, uh, New Year's event a while back. And as a, as a sort of, you know, fun party game, it was, you know, sitting around with pizza and, and friends chatting and playing a game uh the new one worked really well it was uh it's yep. it's light enough that you don't uh you don't have to worry and again you don't have to do the math for your initiative and yeah. uh it, it plays really well and it's fun you know when when the crazy things happen uh they're frustrating but not game killing <laughs> and yeah it was uh it was just really enjoyable as a as a party game uh i can see how as you know a hardcore sitting down at a game night game you you could be disappointed uh, because again they have they have dumped it down some, but it was definitely an enjoyable game for the party environment. Yes, I agree. The other thing to note: one secret to Robo Rally, all editions of the game, you are going to get this game. You're going to look at this game. You're going to read the rules, and you are going to want to make a map that's like three or four tiles, or even more. So you're going to take all the expansion. You're like, I'm going to make a ten by ten grid, and I'm going to put twelve checkpoints. It's going to be awesome. If you did that, you probably started last year, and you're still taking turns now. You do not want, actually, the best games of Robo Rally are one or two boards max. I get the desire that you want to put these boards out with all these cool things, but it's not that easy a game. And because of the random movement, 
it's not going to go smooth. You're not just going to go forward two, turn left, forward two, turn left through there and hit it. You're going to do that and then get pushed and get pushed into a pit and then take damage and then spin around a couple times, which all takes time because every turn you don't go the way you want, you've got to make up that time in another turn later. It becomes a very long game. Do not make that mistake. Like even if you're at a con thinking I have a four hour slot, two boards, maybe three, but two boards don't go more than that unless you want like a huge 12 hour extravaganza. Which could be fun, but just know ahead of time. Play with one map first, then maybe try with two, and then maybe with three, and I usually will not go past three. Or if you can you can also sit down and play and, and, and realize that you're not gonna finish. You're gonna yes. play for a while and, and, and go to it. And that's uh, but but understand that that is your goal. You know, you're you're not going to finish, you're just playing to mm-hmm. play and have fun. Yeah, I think we've done it before where we put out six checkpoints. We're like, we're just going to get rid of checkpoint four, five, six. For whoever gets to three, we're done, okay? Yeah. Uh, and moving on next, we have chess, but different. Yes, chess, but better, in my opinion. Chess is not on this list. The Duke is. This is a, as you can tell, chess variant or a chess like game. You have a six by six grid. You have a Duke. Your opponent has a Duke. You each get a foot, two footmen to guard that Duke. You decide where to put them next to the Duke. You then activate a piece. When you activate a piece, you go, Oh, how does my Duke move? Well, you look right on the Duke and it shows you right on the tile, how the Duke moves. Oh, how's the footman move? Well, look on the footman move and it tells you exactly how the footman moves. Very iconic, very clear Circles mean moves, squares mean jumps, arrows mean um, uh, the uh, bishop movement, whatever you want to call it, sliding. I don't know what you call that. Queen movement. But it's really simple to tell. At a distance, you look. It's very easy to see how the pieces move. Then it gets brilliant because you move that footman and then you flip its tile over and its moves change. And that is just really cool. The other thing you can do is instead of moving a... Th- tile you can reach into a bag full of more tiles and put out more troops on the board now this does add a significant random element to the game you will not find in chess but i think it's better for it so you have capture the opponent's duke do it with your pieces pieces movement right on the tiles nothing to learn ahead of time when you move flip them over and all of a sudden they have new moves very cool very brilliant Awesome game. Lots of expansions out there with new tiles and new ways to do it. You could make it a deck builder where, or a bag builder where you draft your tiles ahead of time. But in the standard game, what's in my bag is the same as what's in your bag. Our odds of drawing anything are equally the same. Absolutely. You know what? I played the Duke once. Uh, that was one of our filler games we played during our uh, launch party. And, you know, it's great fun. One thing a lot of people might find, especially younger players, is that chess can be tedious. Um, the, 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 the thought process, until you've developed it as a reflex, the thought process for planning ahead and looking ahead and waiting while, your other, while your, the other teammate does, or your, other, your opponent does the same thing, can, can wear on, on you. And, and for some people, that's you know, what makes uh, chess fantastic. Uh, but for other people, not necessarily. And the Duke is a faster, more concise game that really uh, sort of compacts it all down, and you don't have to remember funky rules for knights. And you know, oh, how do I castle with my king? Because I mean, or can I castle? Or did I already? Uh, who cares? It's on the it's on the uh, it's on the pieces. Go for it. Fantastic. Next up. One I wasn't familiar with before the first time we recorded this, Alien (laughs) Frontiers. This is a dice-based worker placement game. No, I don't think it's a separate category from worker placement because you're still placing workers. It just happens to be dice are your workers. Uh, Sci-fi game with lots of sci-fi tropes. You are trying to colonize a planet. Multiple factions are, of course, trying to colonize the planet. You want to be the faction who wins and gets to own the majority of the land. You're going to do this by using your spaceships. Your spaceships are dice. You only start with three spaceships. You roll your three dice. You look at the numbers on them. Then you look at the board, and there's a bunch of worker placement spots, which are based on the numbers on the dice. So there's stuff to get you resources. There's stuff to get you energy. There's a board where you can steal such things from your opponents. You can develop new technologies. You can build colonies, uh, colonies, start building the colonies. You can build more ships, and I'm probably missing at least one, but that sounds like it's most of them. 
One of the important ones is you're going to get resources because you're going to use those resources to build the ships and to get technologies. Technologies break the rules, as in most of these games. You get cards that break the basic rules. In this game, because it's a dice-based worker placement game, most of the technologies mitigate dice rolls. They let you flip a die to an opposite side or add plus one or minus one. There are nasty ones that let you steal stuff from other players, and then there are technologies that prevent that, like shields. It's You can blow up the opponent's spaceships. There's other tech cards. It's a very succinct deck of cards. The other main thing you're going to do is build colonies. Now, colonies take a long time to build, so they're on a little time track, and you get these little, they're really cute looking, actually, little plastic domes, and they slowly move along the track as you spend resources, and then when they're full enough, they go down to the planet. Now, the planet is described, or divided up into a bunch of zones, and once we get there, we start playing an area majority game. Whoever owns the her has the majority of colonies in an area gets a special power based on which area they control again things that break the game that give that play controlling player more points you also get points for your stuff on the board what's neat in this game is it's a fluctuating point system so as you gain colonies your points go up but then as you lose colonies they can go down so your scores kind of go up and down a bit this is a tight game what I mean by tight is that everything in there is in there for a reason. And once you've learned things like the tech cards, everything just flows and works really well together. You that there's just like just enough worker placement spots that you can never do everything you want to do. And there's always another player is going to take something you want at a critical moment. And that's going to happen to everyone, not just one person. There's no catch up mechanics, but no one falls far enough behind to feel like you never have a chance. Even when you do roll badly, there's enough ways to mitigate the dice that you can fix that or even bad rolls get you resources. So at least you're building something up for the next turn. This game is a fantastic, it is the top worker placement game on my list right now. The one warning, though, is the game, as I said, is tight. They put out a ton of expansions for this game. A ridiculous number of expansions, and I don't like any of them. Because I find every one you add just loosens up the game. Like, the factions is the first expansion, gives you more worker placement spots. Well, that whole tightness of, man, there's I really want to go there, but this person beat me. Well, now it's like, oh, they beat me there. I don't care. I'll just go over here instead because there's so many spots. It doesn't hurt. I can just play somewhere else. It just feels loose. I like a tight game, and Alien Frontiers is so much better just with the core rules. I know lots of people disagree with me on this, but I... I only own I own all the expansions and the only one I use, like usually you pack everything in one box, carry it together. All the expansions are in one box, Alien Frontiers in another. And when I go to the game store, I just bring Alien Frontiers. And, you know, this is something we talked about last time where the uh, even the names of the expansions are <laughs> yeah. kind of off putting uh, mind control helmet and uh, cranes, <laughs> alien cranes or whatever. It, it's it's just not I'm not really sure what they were thinking. Um, it's it's yeah. an interesting thought, but uh, you know if the core game is good and we can you can enjoy that, go for it. Up next is another worker placement game, but a very different one. This is Orleon. This combines bag building with worker placement so what bag building is is think deck building but with a bag and you put resources in the bag and you pull out a certain amount of them to see what you get in this case it's workers the workers in orleans it's based on medieval france you are building the city of orleans trying to be the most uh get the most renown as uh like a builder or a building guild or something like that i don't know i Sorry, I'm terrible at themes sometimes. Uh, you are going to recruit different types of people. So there's knights and farmers and fishermen and traders and monks. There might be another type. And you're going to start with just a few of them, and you're going to pull from your bag and see what workers you get that turn. Then you have to decide what buildings to send your workers to. And different types of buildings are going to give you resources, or they're going to let you build new buildings, or they're going to let you elect some of your people to the mayorship uh, to form the city council, or you're going to send people out delivering to the neighboring provinces. So you're adding pick up and deliver to bag building. You're adding area majority. The neat thing in this game is it's a tight worker placement game, but you only play on your own board. 
So it's a little different. So yes, you're doing worker placement. Once a spot's taken, you can't take it because there's someone there, but those are your guys. So it's all about managing your own workforce and your own area and doing that better than anyone else. Now there's a lot more going on in the game. A lot of it has to do with the, every time you recruit workers, you get a bonus. So like when you recruit knights, you get one thing. And when you recruit these other guys, you get other things. And it's all about recruiting the right numbers at the right times and watching what the other players are doing and competing in some areas and not in others. Orleans is a bigger, heavier game. I can't do it justice to here, but I strongly recommend anyone who's into Euros at all at slightly higher difficulty level, check out Orleans or have someone that can explain them well with you because it is fantastic. So yeah, again, it's not your family game. It's your, no. uh, it's your gamer's game. And uh, moving on, next we have Anachrony. Okay, coolest set up for a game so it's already post-apocalyptic it's already the world's gone to crap stuff the the world government's collapsed humans are fighting amongst each other this entire uh, area of the world's irradiated things are not going well there are four factions trying to vie for power who's going to run the humans who's going to lead us to the next step while all this is going on, a giant meteor comes in and smashes into the capital. This meteor, and I already forget the word, even though we just talked about the other week, is filled with some kind of special mineral. This special mineral, eventually humans learn to develop it and refine it and find it lets them go back in time. So when you start this game, the meteor hasn't hit yet, but your future self knows it's going to hit. So start sending you resources from the future to you in the past so you can prepare for this meteor to hit. And this is represented in the board game form. It is a worker placement game where you can send yourself resources from the future. Now you have to be careful because once you actually get to that point in time in the future, you better develop time travel technology and actually send those resources back or you risk paradox. It is such a unique and cool theme. As I pointed out in the original episode, this is the gamification of Bill and Ted having to remember to put the keys outside the police station from their father's car that they stole and he needed to find later. Yes, exactly. So now added to that, we have a very solid worker placement game that does something called two-tiered worker placement. So... The game map, you have workers, and there's four different types of workers. I'm not going to get into the different types, but they're represented by cardboard chits. And then you have the outside world, which is terrible and irradiated. So these little chit guys can't go out because they're made of cardboard. They'll melt. It'll be terrible. So they want to get into these giant mechs, actually, called exosuits. So you need to have exosuits to put your cardboard dudes in so they can go outside and not melt. Yes, I know. It's not cardboard. They're not actually melting. But you actually have these exosuits. Now, this is a game, I say, do buy the expansion just for the plastic exosuits. They are fantastic looking, and you actually slot the little cardboard dudes in the top of them to show that they have suits on when they go outside. It's very cool. Uh, you send them outside to gather resources and do stuff. One of the things you can do is build buildings. When you build buildings that go on your player board, now your guys who are inside have something to do because you've now built mines or you've developed technologies. There is a ton going on in this game, and what I love about it is the way it slowly scales up. Because when you first start, you don't have a lot of resources because you are just starting off and you don't know a meteor is going to hit. So you don't have a lot of options and you have nothing to do on your main board, on your player board, just your stuff to do out in the world. And I think there's only six options. Like you can go mining, you can get water, you can trade with the nomads, you can build buildings, you can hire more guys, you can get technology, or you can choose a spot that lets you take a spot someone else already is in, which is a very worker placement thing. It's everything's stolen. Well, you can do this thing to get to use it. So there's really not a lot of options in those first couple turns. You're probably not going to be able to afford a lot of exosuits. So you're not going to have a lot of moves or options. So your decision tree is very contained. But then as the game goes on, you're going to build more buildings and have more choices and you're going to have more workers and you're going to have access to more exosuits and you're going to need more resources. And it just grows. That decision tree branches outwards into this brilliant, fairly heavy game that starts off rather simple for how difficult the game works. 
or sorry, the game looks. The game looks overwhelming. It's a huge table hog. There are counters everywhere. I use two different plano boxes to sort the different resources. And everyone I go to teach this game is like, oh God, this is going to be bad. It's not. Like, it's there's not a lot going on. And the time travel thing is actually handled really well. I'm not going to get into the details of doing it, but there's this way where you get resources. And if you don't pay them back, you're going to pay for it later in the game. So yeah, it's the that, that interesting fact where you, you're you're going to mess with the mess up the timeline if you don't pay back the yes. the resources you use, and and that will uh, eat up victory points in the long run. That is correct. And so next up, we move on to culture and flourishing uh, flourishing culture and commerce in the Belgian Hasiatic city. Yes, we go to Bruges. This, I've said it on the podcast when I first talked about playing this, but it is a mishmash of two things that should not be mashed. You have Steffenfeld point salad and you have quick filler game. And somehow you put the peanut butter and the chocolate together and you get Bruges. I wouldn't quite say filler, but it is under an hour to play a game of Bruges. And you get all the joy that you get from a Steffenfeld heavy Euro game with multiple ways to gain victory points, whether that's building buildings, hiring people, uh, moving up on the prosperity track while mitigating disasters. And maybe all you do the entire game is put out fires and win points from that. Or maybe you build canals around the entire city of Bruges. Lots of different choices. This is another game that uses multi-use cards and uses them brilliantly. Every card can be used to do, I think it's one of six things. It may be seven things. It may be five. One of those includes using the face, like what the card is, which is a person, or you can flip the card over and it's a building and you can then play this card as a building to play this other card as a person in the building. But to do that, you need a worker of the right color. Well, you get that by playing another card of that color to get those workers. And all of this works together in a brilliantly fast game. And the disaster mitigation is to me, one of the fun parts of it is you roll dice at the start of the turn in any really low or sorry really high rolls mean disasters start happening so Bruges can catch on fire it can get uh riots can happen there can be a plague i can't even remember there's other things that can happen all these terrible things can happen to Bruges, and part of the game is mitigating the fact that these terrible things are happening it's steffenfeld point salad played somehow amazingly quickly i love it all right, and you know what? It's it's one of those games we've talked about a few times, and it just keeps coming back, so no wonder it's making this list. <laughs> next, next, we move on to a uh, Japanese battle in Onitama. Yes, Onitama, another chess-like. I guess I like chess-like games, since there's a couple on this list. Not chess, Onitama. just chess-like. Chess-like games, <laughs> yes. I This one's probably more chess-like than the duke so oditama you have a five by five grid sorry theme we are two rival martial arts schools about to battle it out on the field of battle this is actually the field of the mime where i'm going to use the way of the crane and you're going to defend with turtle stance no it's an abstract game on a five by five grid we're going to play cards that tell us how our pieces move and then the brilliant part in this game is it's perfect information you have a subset of the cards that come in the game you shuffle them you grab five i get two you get two one goes in the middle I look at my cards. They tell me how I can move all my pieces. So it's just a little grid and it shows, you know, dot and dot and dot, dot. You're like, oh, that means this guy can move here. But it applies to any of your pieces. So every piece moves based on one of the cards. You pick a card, you move a piece according to that card. That card goes in the middle. Your opponent, or then you take the card that was in the middle. Your opponent does the same thing. They pick a move, it goes in the middle. Then they take your original card. So those same five cards just continue to cycle between the two players, which is brilliant because it's perfect info. There's never a die roll. There's absolutely nothing random in this game once you start playing, again, like chess. So it's all player skill at that point. This game is much quicker, simpler than chess. Five by five grid, two ways to win. One, capture your opponent's shogun. Two, get your, sorry, sensei, not shogun, get your sensei into the opponent's temple. That's it. Winner takes it. You can play a game in five minutes. A really good, deep, strategic one may take 15. This one's simple enough. My oldest daughter can play it. 
but deep enough that Deanna and I love to take this one to the beach because that's the other part about Onitama is the quality of the components is fantastic. It's not a board. It's a neoprene mat. The pieces, I don't know, there's some kind of heavy, thick plastic. The only thing you might have to worry about is damaging those cards, but you can get sleeves for them. Sleeve those cards. You can probably go out and play in the nice thunderstorms we've had all day today here in Windsor. And you know what? It's just one of those, another one of those games where the simplicity of it allows it to become complex and, and enjoyable. Mm -hmm. uh, again and again, we keep coming up to this topic on this show. Um, you know, while, while there is definitely a benefit to the complex and the heavy games, and they have their place, so many times the, the real enjoyable games come from a, a simplicity that combines into complexity rather than starting with something complex. complex. Um, the difference between, you know, the Duke or Onitama and Gloomhaven, where you're starting yes. with something heavy and mm -hmm. complex uh, and, and, and breaking out from there, but never really getting more complex. You're sticking with that complexity straight through, whereas Onitama, you start from something simple that develops into that complexity. Fair enough. Next up, we move on to Concordia. Oh, no, we did it again. again. We did <laughs> I'm it like, again. I didn't do it. Wow. This time, this time it was my fault. Egizia. <laughs> yes. Wow. There is a, there's That's a mental funny. block with the game Egizia that we are not allowed to talk about it, apparently. Not unless it's last. That's funny. On the last episode, I skipped Egizia. And here I'm watching the notes and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I did the Egizia exact again. same thing. All right. Egizia. It is Egypt, you are traveling down the Nile trying to use your growing workforce to build the monuments the Pharaoh wants. The Pharaoh is a harsh taskmaster. It's going to be a difficult task, and you also have to deal with the ever-changing weather. I should write the flipping script for this game. <laughs> I don't know why I couldn't do that last week for the podcast. You guys get the good version. So this game did something new. And people are so, so on it. I love it. So it is a worker placement game. There are so many. It is also a, for a time trial, time track, time track. So similar to Takenoko, Takedo. Wow. I got that intro so good that I fell apart after. To be I, honest, now... you, you, have, you have typed or pronounced Takedo many different ways in our show notes. And, and... No, no. Takenoko is a game about a panda. It's a different game. Okay, because you've called ta Takedo Takenoko a couple of times in Oh, show probably. So. <laughs> yeah, that's not good. They're, they're, they're not at all similar games, except the names are too similar to me. Anyway, so you're traveling down a path. That path is the Nile. The brilliant part is you take a spot, say, here on the Nile, and then you really want to go back and take that one. You can't. You have to go further down the Nile. The difference between this and Takedo is Takedo, you travel the Takedo once. This, you're going to do it multiple times. Actually, a total of five times you're going to go down the Nile. While you're going down in the Nile, you're going to stop at various spots to do things. One of the main things you are going to do is collect food to pay your workers. You're also going to collect bricks because you need the bricks to build the monuments. Now, the thing is, your workers kind of suck. And to get them to build well, you need to do in a very RPG element of leveling up your workers, I would call it. So you are going to travel down the Nile, collect bricks, try to get enough food and collect workers and then grab a bunch of other stuff that are worth bonus points. And along the way, you probably want to stop and build the monuments because that's what scores you points. When you go to build monuments for every brick, you need a worker. So if you want to put three bricks on a monument, you need three bricks and you need a level three work team. Now, the work teams, when you level them up, they get better. You have a level three work team. They all, like, only one work team can work on a monument. And then you have the Joker team. They're kind of green colored. You can team them up with another work team. So say you have your main team is a level three and your Joker is a level two. You can now build five bricks in one turn. When you're building bricks, you get a slight bit of area control where on the pyramid, for example, whoever had the most bricks in a row gets points. Uh, that's one element. You're also going to get points for how there's an obelisk and the, whoever builds the highest up is going to get points. Now, the problem with leveling up your workforce is they get hungry. So you have to feed them. Now, feeding them is great because there's all these fields you can grab going down the Nile. But the problem is there's very, very few green fields. These are fields that will produce food no matter what the weather is. And then there's some, I think they're brown fields, yellow fields. I forget the color. 
yellow. There's yellow fields. There's very few yellow fields. Those are going to be okay as long as it rains a little bit. And if it rains a lot, they're great. But if it doesn't rain at all, they don't produce. And then there's the red fields. Now, the thing with the red fields, they produce the most food, but they only produce if it's actively raining. Well, two of the spots on the Nile let a player adjust how much rain is going to happen. So if you're spending all your time collecting farms, another player notices that, they're going to make sure it doesn't rain. It is a brilliant system. I love the leveling up your workers. There's some really cool endgame scoring stuff. There's something about the game that the theme fits to me. Like, it just clicks. Like, I feel like I'm buying more guys because I am. I'm leveling up my guys. And, of course, if they're going to work harder, I have to feed them more. And, of course, only the green fields produce because of the rain. Like, all of it just ties together really well. I really dig this game. And, unfortunately, so far, it is disproving Tom Vassell's law. Tom Vassell's law is any game, if good enough, will be reprinted. Well, so far, somehow, Agizia has not been reprinted and goes for stupid amounts of money online. It's not good enough to spend $200 on. No game is. Well, maybe people seem to think Gloomhaven is. But it's not that good a game. It's a great game, but not that worth it. I wish this would get a reprint. Everyone I teach this game is like, oh, man, that's good. Where do I get this? And I'm like, sorry, you can't. I don't know how I managed to pick up a copy back when it was easier to find, I guess. Um, now, there are detractors out there that say this game has been Jones theoried by Francis Drake. I don't get that. I don't understand that argument. Now, Jones theory means I got a new game. It's better than this old game. I never have to play this old game again. It, it doesn't fit for me. So, in Agizia, you're getting these workforces, you're leveling them up, you're collecting bricks, and you're collecting food to do stuff. Francis Drake, there's no food, you can't level up your workers, you don't have workers, you're collecting cannons and rum, and you're going out taking your ship that can go backwards and forwards around the map to battle people. Like, the only thing that's the same is you progress down a time track, you can't go backwards. So, yes, it kind of has the Nile thing. And, yes, you go down it multiple times, but that is the only similarity I see between the two. I went so far as the last time I raved about Agizia, I had so many people on Twitter tell me that Francis Drake was better. I went and bought a copy. I then played it three times. I then came home and played Agizia two times. I went back on Twitter and said, you guys are nuts. I just think people haven't played Agizia. Like, they've just heard so many times that Francis, Francis Drake Jones theories it. I don't think the people who said that actually played both. Agizia blows away Francis Drake. I do not have Francis Drake in my collection anymore. I still have Agizia. Well, you know what? And, and everyone has a different view of games, so everyone's entitled to their opinion, and if they want to be wrong about that, they can be. <laughs> Fair oh. enough. And now, moving on... Actually, without skipping anything, we move on to our uh, token Mediterranean game. Yes, our trading in the Mediterranean game. That is that is a meme in board gaming. That the most overused theme in board gaming is trading in the Mediterranean. And yes, in my top games of right now, we have a trading in the Mediterranean game known as Concordia. You are merchants. You start off in Rome. You spread out. Well, depending on which side of the map, you either spread out through Italy or you spread out through Europe. You're going to make trade routes. You are going to build uh, settlements. I'm going to use the term. It uses the Catan houses, so I always think settlements because that's what you call them in Catan. But whatever, you're going to make trading houses. You're going to build your network. You're going to use that to get resources. You're going to trade your resources in for better resources. You're going to score victory points. Everyone's going to have this great time. Concordia combines, takes your pick up and deliver route building uh, point to point movement takes all that Euro game stuff, but throws in a deck building element that is brilliant. Everyone starts the game. I'm going to say eight, eight, eight may be the wrong number, but with eight cards, each of these cards is a different action and they're represented by a different God. So you're going to have your Aries and Zeus and so on. And when you play a card, you do that action on that card. But then the card's played, so your next turn, you no longer have that action available. Then you play another card, and your hand gets smaller, your options get smaller. But one of your cards lets you pick up all your other cards, but you basically have to skip a turn to do that. So brilliant hand management game. Now, here's where deck building gets in. One of the cards lets you buy new cards, which are on the top of the board. Now, this isn't Star Realms Ascension Clank. You're not going to build a deck. You're going to add maybe 
three, maybe five, or if you're lucky, eight new cards to your deck. So it's not the same type of thing. And you're never going to take that deck and shuffle and draw a hand. You either always have available your guys left, or you have everything available because you just played, I can't remember the name of it, but the one card that lets you pick everything up. Now, what's hard to grasp the first time you play this game is those cards are also your end game scoring. So you're going to score on eight different things. Again, it might be nine, it might be seven. Represented by the different guards. And say Ares is how many provinces you have a presence in. So you're going to count up how many provinces you have a presence in and go seven. And I have one Ares card, so I get seven points for Ares. Well, Sean might have drafted three more Ares cards as he played. And he might be in three provinces, but he's going to multiply that by three. Because he has three Ares cards and he's going to get nine points for provinces. Now repeat that for the eight different ways to score. And this part of the game is so hard to grasp that there is actually a tutorial version of the game where you play through one season. Then you stop and you do interim game scoring just so that the players who haven't played before kind of see how it works. Because I have played that game where people didn't rock it, and they're playing, and they think they're great, and they made all these settlements, and they've done all this stuff. Well, they didn't collect the gods that matched what they were actually doing. So they collected a ton of resources, but they don't have any Minerva cards. Again, I'm taking random names. The actual names probably are not the same as what I'm saying. But they didn't collect the cards, so they didn't actually get any points for all that work they did. It's a brilliant game. You've got to play it at least twice before you get it. Like your first play, just throw it out. Like play around, learn some stuff, try some stuff, see how the mechanics work. Don't expect to win. Play it again once you know. And then it's another game where the more you play, the better it gets because you start to learn how many cards there are of each in the deck. You start to know like, ooh, I see there haven't been any Ares cards yet. So that means that's going to be coming in the next round and so on. It adds a strategic level to the game. All right. And next up, we have the Handmade Dexterity Game. That is correct. We actually have two of those on this list. Hamster Roll is a hamster wheel. Big, yellow, wooden, handmade hamster wheel with little slats kind of all over on it. Then every player gets a set of shapes that are little squares, cubes, rectangles, a tube. One player even gets a big cone, and they have to try to put these on the wheel. Now, there's some really specific placement rules about always having to place up the wheel. But what's important is you're going to place a piece on the wheel. It's probably going to roll a bit. You're going to hope nothing falls off, and if it, nothing does, the next player gets to play. And then they're going to keep doing that. If anything falls off, you now have to collect those pieces. The only way to win is to play every piece in front of you. Now, what I really like about this compared to other dexterity games is there is a level of tactics to this game. Because of the shape of everyone's pieces and the limiting rules where you have to play further up the wheel than the last piece played, where you place and how is a lot more important than your physical ability to place the piece. Now, that's also important. But the tactics of, wow, I'm going to place my big, long, tall one here because that's going to force Sean to have to play in the spot above because there's no way he's going to fit a piece in between that and the next gap. I really like the combination of dexterity with the tactics of this game. And it's interesting because I, I, even memorizing the wheel only gets you so far and the pieces, um, you know, because... If you're playing against someone, especially if, who hasn't played on your wheel before, there's a good chance that they're going to play something that you would have never thought of playing. So mm -hmm. your plans are shot because they just dropped something in there that makes no sense to you because you've played it a billion times. And all of a sudden, it's anyone's game because you have no idea what's about to happen. And, and it's really right. interesting that way. Uh, along with the fact that the wheels are handmade, different on every one, and your wheel may pause and you may know that, but nobody else may know that, that your yep. wheel suddenly is going to hold and then until you get just enough weight and then it's going to just go. Um, yep. And so learning your wheel is as much uh, important as learning how to play the game itself. Correct. And also the way the placement of like those spokes, or right? I don't know how to describe them, the little slats, they go up in such a way that if you place pieces right, they can literally hang upside down. Yep. We have seen pieces roll to the top and come all the way back around. Yep. It, it's a brilliantly designed game. And like Sean mentioned, it's handmade. So 
the slats were glued in by hand and like they're not straight like one will be curved a little bit and they're hand cut so one's a little shorter and you don't always notice you're like oh no i'll just put it on this slat and you're like what that should oh wait that's actually on a bit of a slant it's brilliant yep uh and next up we have crokinole racing Yes, we have pitch car. Uh, this was the other one I noted that's handmade. All the tracks in pitch car are hand cut. Oh, I wasn't aware and of that. They try to advertise the fact that this is a feature. I personally think, yes, it is very strongly a feature in Hemster Roll. In pitch car, I disagree. It would be really nice if they actually locked in tight and were perfectly smooth and there weren't little imperfections you bounced off of. Right. Despite that, that's probably the only negative I have to say about pitch car. This is a racing game, big, thick wooden press board pieces with crokinole discs that you're going to flick around these pieces in a race. You're going to do three laps. First person to clear finish line on the third lap wins the game. Some really simple rules for who goes next. Fairly simple crash rules. Just the basic set is a ton of fun, but then you toss in expansions that add levels and ramps and jumps and pits. It is brilliant. One of the best games to have play while having adult beverages. We had a rather fantastic night at Villains Bistro downtown one night where I think we played about 18 games in a row. Excellent. And, uh, you know, there's just, there's so many different tracks available on that one that you can, uh, you can spend a lot of money on that game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, I believe that you have actually... spent a lot of money on that game. I, I've spent quite a bit, but uh, I do my research. So you can follow my research on Twitter, tabletop underscore deals. Every pitch car set I bought, I bought for less than half price. But even then, I'm still probably dropped over $200. It is not a cheap game. It is handmade. It is real wood. It's kind of heavy. It's a bit of a luxury item. It's a small press publisher. I don't know. It's a fun game. That's what justifies it to me. And next up, we have the only party game that makes the list. That is correct. I am not a party game fan. Like, like really, put it this way. I don't like code names. Everyone loves code names. No, not for me. Don't like code names. Uh, Pictomania is okay. It's like a, a gamer's win, lose, or draw. I'd rather play that. There. So I guess win, lose, or draw is dead. I guess it, Pictionary finally won out in that war when I was trying to research something. I'm like, what? You can't find win, lose, or draw anymore. But anyway, drawing games. The only one I really liked is this game called Pictomania because it adds a game element to it that's more than just drawing. I uh, don't generally like them, but I did find one that I love, and that is Concept. This one is so hard to describe without a board in front of me, but think of a ton of icons, like as many as Race for the Galaxy, all over a board with things like uh, animals and people and TV shows and video cameras and stuff that's very obviously what it is. So like it shows a plane and a boat and a building and you're like, okay, that's like travel. Like you can just tell that that's a symbol for travel. Fairly distinct iconography. You take that, then you give a player a clue. Now the clue is a concept. Now let's say it's Spider-Man. So I have the concept of Spider-Man. I'm going to now use these plastic pieces to put them out on the board to try to give you, get the other players to guess Spider-Man. So I may look at it and there's a very obvious man-woman. I'm going to put an exclamation point on the man one because I really want people to get the concept that man is part of my clue. And then I'm like, okay, now I got man down and everyone starts yelling stuff at you and it's every possible man you've ever thought of. Never Spider-Man. So you're like, okay, what's next? So you look and then you're like oh there's a picture of a dude with a cape so a superhero so then i put a cube on that so i'm like look man superhero and then someone probably starts guessing totally the wrong thing and it's talking about the guy with the cape from the new dance show on De in detroit but you're like no and you're not allowed to say anything so then you start trying to put more cubes out and i don't know what the hell i put for spider-man maybe i put one on red and blue because spider-man has a red and blue suit but now someone starts guessing superman you're like oh and you're trying to figure out how to get the concept across to the other players, thus the name of the game. It is the only party game I love. There are some others I like. This one is fantastic. There was one New Year's party where we played 72 times in a row, and we were still having fun. We quit because we had played every card that came in the game. Love the game. Um, and it's not dead that we used it because the next person that when Sean gets Spider-Man, he's going to pick totally different things than I would, right? So the, it's not like the cards are burnt and I can't use them again. It's not legacy concept. Love the game. And next up, we have what was your what, your favorite at one time in life, Power Grid. 
I just the, splashed the, water on myself <laughs> somehow. The game that developed and is known for its own mechanic. Yes, the Power Grid Auction. The, this game has one of the best ever designed board game auctions. So much so that lots of other people put out games and just say, yeah, we use the Power Grid auction. Yeah, we admit it. We stole it. It's that good. We use it. It's it's a really simple auction. All it is is the starting player. So the most the player you want to be most disadvantaged has to start the auction. And this being start player is bad in Power Grid. You don't want to be start player. It means you built more than anyone else, so you have a huge advantage, so they try to balance the game by disadvantaging you. So you have to start the auction, which means you have to pick something, and you have to set the opening bid, which is so hard. And then you might pick something you don't want. Everyone else just passes. You're stuck with it, right? It's terrible. The other thing that is in the Power Grid thing is you always have to bid higher than the person before you, but once you pass, you're out. You are out. You cannot jump back in. And final bids pay only. So if I bid 30 and you win, I get my 30 bucks back. So it's still, it's a pretty simple auction system. It's in a lot of games. The game Fleet uses it possibly better than Power Grid. Great game. So you are going to auction power plants. Then once you get your power plants, you're going to build your network. And it's a big map of wherever, because in the base game, I think it comes with the US on one side and Germany and the other. You're going to pick which side of the map to play it on. You're going to start building routes by building um, power stations and you're going to pay a connection cost to build another power station at the beginning of the game only one person can own each city so it's really cutthroat trying to grab those first power stations then you're going to look at your cities and you're going to look at your power plants and you're going to see if you can supply power but first to fuel these power plants you're going to need resources so there's an very brilliant economy set up in this game where you have this big track with numbers on it and you have all the different resources in the game which there's garbage coal, oil, and nuclear power. And to power your plants, you need those things. So you're going to want to buy coal for your coal plant, or you're going to want to buy oil for your oil plant, or you're going to want to buy garbage for your recycling plant. The thing is, as you buy them, the cost goes up. So this is another one where the player in last place gets to buy first. So again, they get an advantage. They get to buy the coal first. And if they buy all the coal, when you, you might be sitting there thinking, oh, I got 10 bucks left. I can afford coal. Oh, there's the $10, or there's the $3 coal. Oh, that's gone. Oh, the $5 coal. Oh, that's gone. Oh, the seven. Oh, no. And then by the time it gets to your turn, you can't afford the coal because the market has adjusted based on what people are buying. It has a very awesome uh, living economy that evolves based on the players playing every turn new resources generate and as the game goes on it changes and then you get to a second era and now there's new power plants that are better and people can build two into two different cities and so on and it just keeps evolving now a lot of people call this math the game and hate it i i guess there's math but it's basic two to three digit edition it's not hard math you never have to divide anything there's no fractions it just add up how many power plants you have which is say seven look on a card that tells you how much money you get and then take it and then when you're building routes go okay you're building a route in the city that costs 10 and then the connection from windsor to detroit costs five and then i'm going to build one in toledo that's another 10 and then the connection from detroit to, to toledo is 10 so that's 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 7 Oh, I can't do math. No, it's 37. Come on, it's not that hard. I hope I got that right. I probably didn't. It should be terrible. It's Just not remember, be on podcast, our teachers though. lied to us when they said that we would not have calculators with us wherever we went in life. We all do. It's Even if it was complex math, we all still have calculators. Yes, it's not that bad. Like the people I've heard complain about this, I have to assume don't like some other aspect of the game or lose all the time. So don't want to play it and use the math as an excuse. I don't know. But you know what? Some people just don't like really, really don't like math. Yeah, it's fine. Go play Splendor. There's other games out there. Yes, you have to do some basic math. Now, if you love the math in Power Grid, there is a game called Power Grid Factory Manager. That actually did feel like I was playing a spreadsheet. I like mathy games i did not like power grid factory manager so if you don't think there's enough math in power grid go play factory manager personally i think it's at the sweet spot it's a brilliant game i was really happy when we were at brimstone games early tonight to watch a group of 16 to 20 year olds sit down and break out a five-player game of power grid i haven't seen that game played locally in a long time and it's an older game and seeing that played tonight actually kind of filled me with joy i'm like oh that's awesome they're playing power grid yeah, maybe they listen to our uh, episode. <laughs> yeah, maybe. 
Uh, they did go ask someone else for game advice. So I'm assuming if they did listen to their episode, they didn't know who I was. Right. <laughs> so next up, we have Wetsrai der Handler. <laughs> otherwise known. Yes, otherwise as known as Hansa Teutonica. Hansa Teutonica. Warhammer <laughs> fantasy roleplay with all, all the fun stuff. You are a German merchant moving around the Hanseatic League during the Teutonic period of extra sleeves and daggered cuts, uh, going around and establishing something called the Hanseatic League. So this was a rough mishmash of abused businessmen who decided to basically form a union. They formed one of the first guilds in Germany. The thing was, it went really good at first until... Offices just started saying, yes, we're members without actually meeting anyone. And the whole thing became this huge mess where no one knew if they were in or out and people had Hanseatic symbols, but weren't part of it. And it was just a big mess. Well, this represents you being people causing that mess. You're all rival guilds trying to set up your own version of the Hanseatic League. The way this works, though, is a route building game that is surprisingly reminiscent of Ticket to Ride, but it's actually a good game. You are sitting there putting cubes out connecting routes and once you collect a route you can build an office and once you build an office you are going to score victory points and if you connect the right offices you're going to get to level up your ability to do these things there's only five different actions and each of these actions is extremely simple to teach the first time but with the number of routes that are out on the board the number of decisions is huge like it's crazy i have this cube and i can put it on 250 different spots where's the best place to go then you add to that that one of the main actions is to bump someone else's stuff and steal it for you so do i go take this route no one's on or do i bump this route or do i try to do that now when someone owns an office anyone who connects a route to that gives you points so do i really want to build there because if i finish that route i'm going to give deanna points and i don't want to give her points i want points for me now this goes along with bruges all this happens with all these decisions this great map of journey all these routes being built in about an hour and a half or less it is another fantastically heavy game for the amount of time it fits in. I didn't know until this year. I seem to love what it, uh, heavy cardboard calls them. Oh, damn it. Things not to tap on. Thinky fillers. Think, thinky fillers. Now, I wouldn't call it. Yeah, I know. Don't tap the <laughs> keyboard. Uh, after your chair earlier, I figured I owed you. All right. <laughs> So, yes, they, they call them thinky fillers. So I'm, I'm starting to love that term. Like, I don't know if I quite call this a filler. An hour and a half isn't really a filler game. Now, compared to a six-hour game or a four-hour game, sure, it's awfully short. But just the feeling you get from, like, you finish this game and you're kind of tired. You did a lot of in-your-head math, and this isn't sim – it's not power grid math. It's a very different – it's all about optimizing every turn you can with a ridiculous variety of options. So not only optimizing, but trying to find – that right move. And then it seems like every time you find it, someone screws you over or they take it before you can. You're like, Oh, I see those two. And you're waiting for it to get around to your turn. And then someone else spots it and takes that spot. And now you got to rethink your whole turn. I really dig Hansa Teutonica. Now this one, I only found this year. So I don't know how well it's going to stick around, but right now I'm loving it. Now, Jamie, uh, Wilt Chamberlain in our chat room, mentioned that there is an expansion for this that makes it even better and oh man i want to find it now sadly i didn't know this when i bought it the game is long out of print and again going for stupid money now i got lucky getting a copy because a local uh cafe closed so i was able to get some of their new old stock actually with i think this one was unpunched when i got it i didn't know at the time that it's been long out of print so i feel bad for really strongly recommending this game you can't actually get sadly it seems like quite a few games on this list are like that but hansa tonica if you can find a copy definitely check it out now i'm showing four expansions on uh on board game geek are those uh there's one expansion you can buy, and then the others are like con exclusives and promos. Yeah. It looks, I forget. It looks like there's two you could buy, but it's hard to say. It, the, I wish they would separate out expansions from other, other yes. things. Because the East expansion in 2010 and the Britannia expansion in 2014, and then the one other is two, just a map. Ah, okay. I know one is just a new map. It doesn't add any new rules. That's probably Britannia then. Okay. So yeah, East Expansion would probably be the expansion. And Britannia would be the map. 
And then there's yeah, that other, sounds about right. There's two other that are very obviously not real expansions. Well, that was a thorough, exhaustive, and perhaps to yes. some exhausting examination <laughs> of the top twenty. Um, I'm glad I'm not editing this one down to a podcast. Yeah, we're good this time. <laughs> we're all good. Um, you know, when we sat down to do this, I was planning on trying to be quicker, and instead I just couldn't stop talking. So. Yeah. Well, we've had uh, any number of people in the chat room, and I saw we've had five or six viewers on and off throughout the show. So I hope people have been enjoying the content we've been providing for them uh, and uh, take something of value out of this uh, top 20 list. Sounds good. So that list was what uh, Board Game Ranking Engine gave me. It's not quite what I expected. Like, there's some games I love that are not there. Like, Core Worlds is my second favorite deck builder. I, how did that not make the miss, list? Or Food Chain Magnet, a deliciously heavy game about managing fast food chains. That didn't make the cut either. Well, the method used by uh, BGRE is not without its flaws. Uh, unfortunately, to do it... Uh, <laughs> Apparently, we're, uh, our, uh, our moderator's laptop battery can't survive our, epi- our episode. Of <laughs> uh, but anyway, the method used by Board Game uh, ranking, re- engine. ranking Engine is not without its flaws. Uh, unfortunately, to do an actual scientific examination of this, you would literally have to compare every game against every other game. And even yeah. once you narrow it down to only ones rated more than seven and no... That's still a lot of comparisons. We're getting into factorial numbers here. Uh, so that's not realistic. So what we're planning on doing well, what we'll plan on doing is we'll make this at least an annual event and uh, be sure to check back next time to see what games make our list next time. Now this was a great talk. If you'd like to see more on the topic, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see this and other questions answered in blog form, and in this case, very differently. Yes. Be sure to send us your questions over on the website under Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Patreon patrons at the good tip or better level get their questions bumped to the top of the list. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and a thank you to our backers. Misdirected Mark... The support you have shown for this new effort has been amazing. Duran Bordet, thank you. Brian Kurtz, thank you. Joe Swick, we are going to game together sometime. It will happen. Be sure to check out our other brother podcast, The Misdirected Mark, where Chris, Phil, and Bob talk about gaming and game mastering every week. 8.45 8.45 Eastern, 6.45 the Queen's time. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website, tabletopbellhop.com, for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us and hang around in the penthouse suite for an off the books, unless you're a patron, after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.